Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the gift of your word, and um, we pray that you would add to that gift now the gift of your Holy Spirit to open the word to our hearts, and open our hearts to your word, that we would be fed and built up in our faith for the glory of your name. Amen. If you knew nothing at all about the Christian faith, um, then I think the coming of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, which we recall on what we know in the West as Palm Sunday, I think that event would be possibly one of the strangest events recorded in the New Testament. Why a donkey? Why so many crowds turning out for this? Why the palm branches and the garments being strewn on the road? Why the tremendous excitement that was generated? And these shouts of Hosanna? And why do all four Gospels record in some detail this particular story. What is the special significance of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on that day? You see, for the previous three years, Jesus had been walking all over Palestine and Galilee, healing and teaching but now, suddenly, as he made his way into Jerusalem, he suddenly chooses to mount a donkey to ride the last two miles into the city. And the crowd went wild with enthusiasm. Why, you may ask? Well, perhaps if I can set the scene of this first Palm Sunday for you, just uh, by way of background, Sunday was a working day in Israel. But on this particular occasion, there were something like two million people on holiday camping on the Mount of Olives. Two million was the number that came to Jerusalem for the Passover. And the excitement was intense. They would sing on the hills. They would pull out the equivalent of their guitars and their stringed instruments. Um, and they were living on those hills in tents. And it was just a, a great festival. It was like a huge Glastonbury festival, if you like. And they'd sing in groups, and they would sing, in particular, from Psalm 118. Uh, it was a psalm especially for Passover. And it was a cry to God to be delivered from their enemies. A cry which included this word, Hosanna, which doesn't mean hooray, it means save us now. And those words in Psalm 118 would be what they were singing, O Lord, save us, O Lord, grant us success, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what they were singing. And every year, as Passover came round, there was this sense of expectancy. Save us now. Set us free now. And Hosanna was a kind of liberation slogan, if you like. Um, when I lived in South Africa, uh, many of the, the people there sang songs with liberation slogans. They were freedom songs. 
and the Jews were no different. They sang their freedom songs every Passover. And on this occasion, in particular, because now, at last, they believed that they had got the leader that they needed to set them free. And the news spread around all the encampments around Jerusalem, Jesus is coming. Jesus is on his way. And the whole crowd turned out to welcome him. Must have been an incredible sight. The, the pent-up feelings of years were going to be unleashed. All their hopes for centuries were now going to be centered in one person. There was only one occasion in the previous 400 years when the Jews had been free from foreign domination. And it was under a family of brothers who were very skilled resistance fighters. They were called the Maccabees. And those of you with a musical background uh, will know only too well um, the name Judas Maccabeus. But it was when his brother Simon Maccabeus came to Jerusalem years earlier that the people then had ripped off the palm branches to make instant flags to welcome this resistance leader who they believed was going to set them free. And now they thought history was going to repeat itself. And so the crowd went out to the Mount of Olives to meet the procession of Jesus with his disciples coming in. Essentially, this was a nationalist uprising. I hope that doesn't spoil the story for you. But this is why they shouted, Hosanna, save us now. And the events of this day prove without a shadow of a doubt they thought that Jesus was coming to be a kind of political liberator, a kind of super Ben-Hur who would release them from Roman oppression. And they thought they'd found the person they'd been waiting for for hundreds of years. Here is a man who's a miracle worker. He's a wonderful teacher, a healer, a friend of everybody. Wouldn't you like a man like that to be president? And when Jesus got on that donkey and he started to ride towards Jerusalem, they thought that the moment had finally come. Now perhaps you can understand why Palm Sunday just exploded with excitement. Why the crowd just took off. When they saw this man who was already rumored to be fit to be king, riding in on that day into a crowded Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, they said, it's here, it's now, he's going to be king. But they made a fatal mistake. They misunderstood Jesus. The tragedy of this day is that he had something to say to them which they didn't want to hear. And they never heard. I'm going to read the verses now from Luke chapter 19. And if you uh, can have it open in front of you, it may be a help. from verse 35 in Luke 19. The disciples brought the donkey to Jesus and they threw their garments on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their garments in the road. 
and as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to cast out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, and my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him and they couldn't find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging upon his words. But the people who welcomed Jesus that Palm Sunday didn't really hear or see, in effect, what Jesus was wanting to to communicate to them. Um, with a crowd that size, uh, I, I guess, um, Jesus would never have made himself heard anyway if he had tried to speak to them. So he spoke to their eyes rather than to their ears. And the way he did it was through a donkey but they still missed the message. They had eyes only for the one who sat on the donkey, but they missed the significance of the donkey itself. Because Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy in the Old Testament from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. which says, Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion! Shout for joy, you people of Jerusalem! Look, your King is coming to you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Why is that mentioned? What is the significance of a donkey? Well, donkeys are not used for beach rides in Palestine. They are of a far higher status in the Middle East than they are in the West. You see, when a king came in peace, a donkey was his chosen mount. A king riding on a donkey was a king who was coming to bring peace. And the crowd picked up on the prophecy from Zechariah, certainly. But they stopped at verse 9 and they didn't go any further. They should have known their Bible better. Because when Jesus did anything, he nearly always had a biblical background for it. Because if you look at what verse 10 says, 
The Lord says, I will remove the war chariots from Israel and take the horses from Jerusalem. The bows used in battle will be destroyed. Your king will make peace among the nations. Or he will proclaim peace to the nations. In other words, he's not a revolutionary. He's not a political resistance fighter because he doesn't believe that true peace comes from being set free from others. How does real peace come? I can tell you in a word when you are set free from yourself. That is real freedom. Everybody wants to be free from this or that. From things outside of them. But Jesus wants us to be free from ourselves. From that which is within us. From sin. From unforgiveness. From emotional trauma and wounds, from pride, from self-centeredness. That's what Jesus comes to liberate us from. But the crowd missed the significance of the donkey. Jesus didn't come to start a war. He hadn't come to get rid of the Romans, but to set us free from self and give us his real peace. And in verse 41 of, of Luke chapter 19, we're told that Jesus saw the city and he wept over it. Why? What was wrong? The answer is that the crowd, they saw it as a day of triumph. But Jesus saw it as a day of tragedy. They thought it was the end of all their troubles. Jesus had seen that it was the beginning of their troubles. Now why? Well, the answer is very simple. They didn't understand what makes for peace, for real peace. I wonder what your idea of peace, shalom, is really like. What, what picture does that word conjure up in your mind? A Sunday afternoon on a day like this, Maybe sitting in a deck chair in the garden with lovely hedges and birds singing, that sort of thing. Is that possibly your idea of peace? There was an uh, occasion I, I read about a while ago of two artists who were commissioned to paint a picture simply with the theme of peace. Um, it was uh, a commissioning for a political building um, for the foyer. And one of them painted a draft picture um, which showed a, a lovely serene woodland scene um, with the sun shining through the branches of the trees onto bluebells below. And there wasn't a leaf stirring in the wind. And he entitled it Peace. The other artist painted a picture of a cliff and the waves were pounding against the foot of this cliff and the spray was going high into the air. The gale was blowing and it was blowing all the grass and the shrubs on the side of the cliff sideways with the force of the wind. And the whole picture was one of turmoil 
But right in the middle of this picture, halfway up the cliff, was a bird sitting on a nest. And he called it peace. If only we knew what made for peace. That was what Jesus lamented in this passage. The things that we think are made for peace are comfort and health and money for us to live on comfortably, a pleasant home, a family round about us, children who love us, security, our old age provided for. These are the things that we think make for peace. And people today think that the things also that would make for peace would be to remove people like President Putin from Russia or Kim Jong-il in, in North Korea. Have them put in prison. Get them locked up. and Stop the bombing and we'll all have peace. Oh, says Jesus, oh that you knew the things that make for peace. Our idea of peace and the Lord's idea of peace are often very different. And the things that we want for a peaceful life are not necessarily the things that make for peace. They may make for a tranquil existence, but not for peace, shalom, the kind of peace that God seeks. That word means harmony with God. And first of all it means getting your sins forgiven, getting the wrong things put right. It means the things in your heart, the things within you that are, are wrong the things within that are causing you torment, that haven't been dealt with. And it begins inside you rather than someone else. Not the Russians, not the Islamic State, not the government, but the things in your heart that are wrong. That's what makes for peace. When you get those things put right. And when you've got the wrongs put right in your own life, then you're able to sing the words of that hymn. The storm may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me so can I be dismayed. That's peace. That's shalom. And Jesus wept. He said, you think I've come to set you free from the Romans? You think that makes for peace? Oh, if only you knew. And Jesus could see what the kind of nationalistic spirit within them was going to lead to. The crowd had totally the wrong idea. And therefore it is no accident that this same crowd that shouted Hosanna, a few days later were shouting crucify him. Why? Because a crowd always turns on those who don't give them the kind of peace that they want. And that is the tragedy. And the crowd, a few days later, said, Release to us Barabbas! And who was Barabbas? A resistance fighter. 
Barabbas was a leading member of the Palestinian Hezbollah of those days. And there were these demands. Release our resistance fighters. Release those who have put in prison for violence. Barabbas is the person we want. And the same people who welcomed Jesus on Palm Sunday a few days later were saying, oh, he's no good after all. We want Barabbas. Because they'd now realized to their horror that if Jesus became king, he wouldn't start by sorting out the Romans. He'd start by sorting out them. Because when Jesus went through that golden gate into Jerusalem, all that crowd of two million expected him to turn right and make for the fortress Antonia, which is where the Roman garrison was stationed. If Jesus was going to stage a coup, that would be the obvious place to begin. But instead, Jesus turned left. And do you know where he went? He went into the temple. And he found it like Birkenhead Market on a Saturday morning. And he used a whip on the Jews. You see, that is the surprise of Palm Sunday. That is the shock to the people. Jesus is saying, I've come to deal with you. Not to deal with those other people. Not to deal with those that you think are to blame for your troubles. Not to deal with those who you think have robbed you of your peace or those who have ruined your life. I've come to deal with you. And God's message to them and to us is a very simple one. The Lord wants to deal with his people first. He wants to save us First, we're very conscious, aren't we, of the, the troubles of the world. It's very easy to blame this group or that group for firing missiles and dropping bombs and causing trouble. But the Lord says, I've come to save you. And there is something in us that wants to be saved from everything else, but not saved from ourselves. There's something in us that says, Jesus, change the world, but don't tamper with me. And he may be saying to us, look, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I meant your life to be a life of prayer. And what have you made of it? I want to deal with you. I've come to save you from that which is robbing you of real peace. Peace with God and peace within yourself. Did you come to worship this evening feeling burdened, feeling that there is some problem in your life that you want God to take away, can I just ask you to let the Lord deal with that which has removed your peace first. To remove not the problem itself first, but that self-life 
that robs us of peace in every situation. A life, perhaps, that wants just to be free from trouble, but not from sin. A life that may perhaps be more concerned about physical health than spiritual health. A life that's more concerned with the way things work out here on earth than how we'd expect life to be in heaven. A life that has shrunk from the cross and wants a cushion instead. And Jesus is challenging us through this story. I'm riding into your heart, the temple of my Holy Spirit. I am riding into your heart on a donkey. I'm coming myself to deal with you, my people, and save you from sin. Then we can tackle all the other problems. Then we can begin to talk about putting the rest of the world right. Then we consider, can consider all the matters of your circumstances and the things that are, those things that have happened to you. Maybe the physical disabilities that you're struggling with. Maybe the emotional pain that's bottled up inside you. But let's first deal with the inner temple of your spirit. Let's get that clean. Let me whip out of it what should not be there. Let me put my people right first. That's really the message of the first Palm Sunday. And to be honest, we're probably not so excited about that. And I guess that that is the, the point when the Hosannas began to fade. Because as soon as Jesus began to attack the Jews, not the Romans, all the excitement went. And the crowd turned away and said, he's not going to do it. He's not going to bring us peace. He's going to upset us. He's going to disturb us. He's going to rock the boat. And so Jesus came and having cleaned out of the temple what should not be there, he showed that the real problem was in them. He didn't talk about the Romans. He didn't talk about King Herod or about Pontius Pilate. He was saying, what about you? You. And the Lord Jesus wants us to be willing to say, Lord, would you cleanse my temple? Put me right. So that I can be a center of your peace in the world. And you can reign on the throne of my heart. You see, Jesus doesn't come primarily to get us out of our troubles, but to get us out of our sins. Because that is the heart of all true peace. And if we want the peace that passes all understanding that the Bible talks about, we need to welcome him by saying, Jesus, please come in and inspect every part of my life. It's all very well for us to sing today hymns like Make Way, Make Way for the King of Kings. But what do we do with Christ on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday? Is he our king then? Is he our prince of peace We sometimes, I guess, do think that Christianity is for 
religious people. And it isn't. It's for forgiven people. The peace follows forgiveness. Which is why the Apostle Paul says in, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a peace which the world cannot give. And it is also a peace which the world cannot take away either. And if Christ is your Prince of Peace, you can know peace in your heart and in your conscience in the midst of a situation of suffering, in the midst of pain, in the midst of loneliness and depression and illness, or what have you. And some of you, I'm sure, can testify to the tremendous peace that Christ has given you in your situation, which may be far from ideal. But that is a priceless possession. It's a peace which the world cannot give. And Christ the King, Christ the Prince of Peace, comes to our hearts tonight and says, can I come in and sort out what's not right? And my prayer is that we not only understand the significance of that first Palm Sunday in our minds, but far more that we experience the sovereign peace and the Lordship of Jesus Christ now and always within our own hearts. Shall we bow our heads and pray for a moment? Lord Jesus, we fall so easily into the same trap that those Jewish people fell into on Palm Sunday. Uh, we've thought that if you change the outward circumstances of our lives that everything would be all right. That if you took away from us the, the trying situations that irritate us or get us down, that if you placed us into an ideal situation, then Lord, we'd be all yours. And how wrong we've been. So Lord, we now seek your peace within. We realize that you may have to take a whip to some of the things within and turn out of the temples of these bodies the things that are spoiling it as a house of God. And then we pray that you would teach us. Right into our hearts we pray this evening. We won't tell you so much what we want, but we want to allow you to ride in and do what you want. For your name's sake. Amen.